So my friends, please take your Bibles this morning, your devices, and would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8. If you're new with us this morning, we are continuing on a journey through the book of Romans. We started just over a year ago, and we're just taking one section at a time, unpacking this. One verse at a time, unpacking uh, what God has said to us through His servant Paul in this wonderful Mount Everest of a book, Romans. In brief review so far in this book, to kind of bring us on the same page and lead us right into the discussion today, you'll remember that in Romans chapter 1, we found this overarching theme, the gospel of Jesus Christ that reveals the righteousness of God, the good news. Again, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. By faith to faith. So this includes the entire journey of the believer. And so that's what we've been, that's what we've been studying. That's what we've been unpacking through the book of Romans. Particularly, as you go through chapters 1 through 3, we have interacted with this concept, the concept of universal condemnation because of sin. Very clearly articulated by Paul in Romans 1 through 3. But then as you travel into chapters 4 and 5, we see this. The concept of God's gracious justification through faith in Jesus Christ. A wonderful text of Scripture. As you continue on, by the way, this is on the back of your handout. You can kind of see the outline, the journey. From the condemnation, from the universal condemnation to the gracious justification, we head into this concept of preserving, persevering sanctification through the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is wonderful. This journey, this ongoing process of growth, and now, in Romans 6 through 8, uh, sorry, the end of Romans 8, so Romans 6 through 8 leading into the ro- end of Romans uh, 8, we are talking about glorification. Promised glorification that is anchored in, as we saw the last two weeks, promised glorification that is anchored. And what is it anchored in? It is anchored in God's eternal plan. This glorification is the fact, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that one day we will be all given a new glorified body. A glorified body that is fully fit to enjoy the glory and presence of a holy God. That day is coming, my friends. Hold on to that with all you have. That is this entire section on glorification. Because they have experienced inward change through the Spirit, the cross of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, come alive in our hearts. Because we've experienced this inwardly, one day when Christ returns, all true believers will be fully changed. There will be a day when we, all those who have come to Jesus Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, Praise God, we'll say goodbye to sin, pain, sickness, and death. So far, as we've been been looking at this uh, this glorification, we've looked at glorification's hope. Romans 8, 18 through 27, we found confidence in glorification's guarantee. That was last week. I would encourage you, if you missed last week's study, please go back and listen very carefully. This is the guarantee that what God started in your life, He will finish. This is the guarantee that you will get there by God's grace. We found the promise not only of this amazing verse. verse, All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So, for these believers who've come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, all things will work together for eventual good. God is doing all things for His glory and for the eventual good of His people. 
according to his golden, you remember this last week, his golden chain plan. That's Romans 8, 29 and 30. According to this golden chain, that you can't just have one of the links of this chain, they all go together. This is who God is, his foreknowledge, his predestination, his calling, his justifying, his glorifying. They all go together. You cannot separate these. And according to that, we find an amazing guarantee that what he started, he will finish. Why? Because he is at the center of his gospel, not you or not me. The temptation of our hearts is to weasel ourselves right into the center of the gospel. It is not all about us. It was about Him and His glory. So today, this will be very personal. I love this text. So we've gone through some pretty rich theological truths, even in just two or three verses. This golden change, sometimes it blows your mind. I believe it's meant to. Even when you get to the end of chapter 11, you're going to see this blows your mind. You cannot completely wrap your mind around the truths of Romans 8, 29, and 30. You can't. The whole concept of divine election, the doctrine of election, very biblical and very beneficial in the life of a believer. You will not completely be able to wrap your mind around this. But we have God's Word that explains it to us. So whatever God's Word says, we believe. We hold to. Even if we cannot completely understand it, We believe it. So, as you get into this text, and you'll see today's discussion point is glorification's assurance. Maybe right now in your mind you're thinking, last week, Pastor Andrew, we talked about glorification's guarantee. This week, glorification's assurance. Isn't that like the same thing? (laughs) Well, I would say yes, sort of, but no, I believe they're different. What are you talking about? Okay, when I see what we talked about last week, glorification's guarantee, when I think about this guarantee, I think very legal. I think very factual. This is a dynamic truth. But then even as you go through the Scriptures and you see as John exposes this, this assurance, when we talk about this assurance, it's very personal. It's very relational. This is so good because the truths that we're learning in the book of Romans, they're not meant to just be put up here. They're meant to be lived out every day of our lives. They're meant to be very relational. The truths that we looked at last week, all things work together for good to those who love God. The golden chain of of foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification, all of that working together, it's not meant to stay cerebral. It's meant to be lived with shoes on every day of our week. And I believe that's where Paul's going now with verses 31 to 39 of Romans 8. Before we read this, though, maybe this week you've been struggling a bit. I mean, if, if, if I could just speak openly for a couple minutes. Unashamedly, our goal through this study is to find the intention of the Scriptures, and this is the intention of the Scriptures, that we right-size God and right-size ourselves. God is God, and I am not. Okay, my friend, that wrestling match that you have in your mind right now or through this week, I'm going to tell you that is a wrestling match that is not new. Where do we find that? We find that in the garden. (laughs) This temptation, and if you want to go beyond that, sometime in eternity past, after God had created the angels, there was this primary beautiful angel, Lucifer, and he struggled with this. He wanted to be God, and so there's this temptation that we make ourselves God. We want to be at the center of our own salvation. We want to be at the center of all of that happens here. And we have to constantly remind ourselves this, God is God and I am not. However, as you process this, and please hang with me here, the struggle of our hearts, the temptation for so many as they consider these biblical truths, again, if I could just speak openly, is this temptation 
to create a false character of who God is. We're good in this whole discussion of false caricatures. Saying things that the Bible doesn't about God and about us. One of those false caricatures that we struggle with, if we're all honest, is we inadvertently paint God out to be some unapproachable dictator in this discussion. A transcendent tyrant. A heartless, impervious, intolerant father. He interacts with his children purely on a business level, production level. You're mine, you're not. In our minds, we paint this picture of this God that quite honestly, we struggle with. Romans 8, 31 through 39, this very personal appeal from the Apostle Paul couldn't be more from that, from that false temptation. From that temptation. This couldn't be further from the truth. Paul leads us into processing the fact that my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if you have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, you, my friends, have a very loving, compassionate, caring Father. He is with you every step of the way. Those struggles, those trials that we read about in Romans 8 so very clearly, that inner groaning that we read about, You can't express it even in words. And the Holy Spirit of God is interpreting these in our prayers. Those groanings. Those ones that you can't express to anybody else in the body. Because tears come to your eyes. That pain comes to your stomach. Those. You know what they are. There's an assurance in the Scriptures that all along the way you have a loving Father was walking with you the entire way. That is Romans 8, 31 through 39. Would you go with me as we read this text of Scripture now? Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him, Christ, graciously give us all things? I'll just say this right now. Not all things we want, all things we need in our spiritual lives. All right, This is not some false name it, claim it type theology right here. That is not this. Verse 33. Who? shall bring any charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Verse 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that. He was ra- who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sakes we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. Verse 37. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death I love this. Nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What did we just read, my friends? Here, through these wonderful verses today, we find intended comfort to the believer. This comfort is glorious, and this comfort leads us to this key truth. Here's the key truth that we're going to wrap our minds around today. God's plan is saturated in His enduring love. 
Don't forget this. If we want to advance this a little bit, as, as is indicated on your handout, to include the context, it would have to be something like this. As they persevere in hope of future glorification, all true believers must find confidence in the personal assurance that, here it is, God's plan is saturated in His enduring love towards His people. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we can truly get up in the morning with overwhelming comfort. We can truly persevere through every workday with unexplainable joy. We can truly go to bed every night with indescribable contentment, even in the broken world we live in. Why? Because not only is God the all-powerful, strong-armed, sovereign king of the universe, he is the all-knowing, ever-present, caring, gracious, kind, long-suffering father that our hearts yearn for. Romans 8, 31 through 39 shows us how we can truly express the Romans 8, 28 love for this God. Remember Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good to those who love God. How can we love this God? This shows us how and why we can love this God. As you've probably already identified as we've gone through this, this section is very structured. <laughs> this is so good. This is a, this is a doxology of sorts. So it's not a, a, a traditional uh, doxology, doxology, but it is of sorts. If you notice when we're reading through it, it's full of what? Questions, all right? Technically, there's 13 questions in these verses. Paul asks questions, Paul answers questions with questions. He's overwhelmed with questions in this passage, leading us to the right conclusion about our God. As you can see in your handout, the structure of this is beautiful. Starting with this conversation starter, what then shall we say to these things, leading us then to four wonderful questions of assurance. After every single question, he follows it with a very brief assurance. These are pegs that we hang our assurance on every single day. Question, assurance. Question, assurance. Question, assurance. Four questions, four assurances, followed by Two of the most dynamic verses in all of Scripture. Preceded by one of the most thought-provoking verses in all of Scripture. So we're talking about Romans 8, 37 through 39. So what, what let's do this morning, let's just walk through Paul's heart overflowing in this passage. Starting with this. Glorification's assurance, this conversation starter. What is the conversation starter? How does he enter into this paragraph? He's just talked about this hope of glorification, this guarantee of glorification. Now, what is the comfort that has come to your heart? Here's how he starts the entire discussion with a question What then shall we say to these things? Not a ton to say about this, but we want to identify who the we is. We are those who have been called. These are those in the golden chain that we talked of last week. Those who we saw in, in, in chapters 4 through 6 are those who have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Who've experienced justification, not on their own merit, but based on in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone. Remember these concepts. That's the we. Paul says, what shall we say to these things? What are these things? Well, are the things we talked of last week, certainly. This golden chain. This assurance that God is going to finish what he started. This assurance that God is the center of the gospel, not you or me. But you got to think beyond just that, though. As you walk through even the, the, the flow, the outline of the book of Romans, there's, there's going to be a dynamic change between chapter 8 leading into chapter 9. And we have to come to some conclusions about this God. So what is this when he says these things? Almost you could say he's talking about the entire gospel that we've unfolded from chapter 1 to chapter 7. 
It's almost like he's sitting back with pen, with quill, actually sharing these words to to, the Emmanuensis Tertius, and he's sitting back. And it's like, what shall we say to these things? Tertius is like, did you want me to write that? Yeah, write it. What shall we say to these things? Here's another way of saying it. How do we possibly process this? How should we personally process this information in the broken world we live in? We're talking about justification, sanctification, glorification for the condemned sinner. I I like to look at it this way. One of my dearest friends up in the mountains in Colorado when we lived there was a godly older saint, uh, one of our deacons at the church, and he was a gifted teacher of the word. His name was um, Charles. And it was funny because every time he taught the word, he had, I think, two if not three pairs of glasses in his pocket. (laughs) And he'd get up and he'd put his glasses on so he could see the Bible. He'd put them back, put another pair on so he could see the people put them back, and he just kept flipping the whole time. All right? Why do I bring that up? Again, sorry, ridiculous. But there's certain lenses we need to see things clearly, okay? And I think that's what Paul is saying in this text. How, what lenses should we put on to process what we've just heard in Romans chapter 1 to 8? How do we need to see this? Well, now he starts with a key question. These are the lenses to process this information. He starts off with this key question. If God is for us, probably the better conjunction there would be, since God is for us, based on the assurance of the previous two verses, since God is for us, who can be against us? My friends, think of this. Since this God, Paul says, that I have articulated so vividly in this epistle has brought us onto his side, who could ever possibly oppose us with an eternity of success? You can't match this. You can't oppose us with success. The concept of oppose doesn't really preclude or exclude the presence of opposition. We need to think through that. It doesn't mean you'll never be opposed in your life. It has a false concept of what the gospel can do for you. But it does mean this. There will never, ever, ever be success to this opposition when it comes to eternity. They might oppose you and say, this God's not worth it. You're not worth it. Who can oppose you? And now what is the assurance that Paul so giftedly brings to us through the Spirit? He who did not spare his own son, (laughs) but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What's the thought? I mean... Paul has just answered his question with a power punch question. I mean, the conclusion is like, you don't even, it's like the no-brainer question. Since God provided his own beloved son as the sacrifice to see this plan happen for his adopted children, why in the world would he not supply the rest of your need to bring his glorious plan to its intended conclusion? Why would God provide his own son for part of the story, but not see you to the end of the story? Doesn't make sense. God is not going to rescue the lifeless body from the frozen lake to abandon it on the shore. Think of it that way. Rescued you? No. There you go. No, God will see this through. Again, we go to Philippians chapter 1, what being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus Christ. What God has started, he will finish. Key question, if God is for us, who can be against us? Key answer, he didn't even spare his own son to make this happen. Why would he give up on it? 
Let's go to the next question. You following? You following the structure? Because it's great. These are pegs we need to go to every single day of our lives. Here's the next question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who will point the finger with a valid accusation towards God's adopted children? Bring any charge means uh, to make a courtroom accusation of guilt. It means to impugn. Impugn. It is to point your finger at you and say, guilty. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? What a wonderful way of describing those who have been called and those who have participated in God's golden chain. This is clearly meant to be an assurance that is to be embraced by every single believer. And we need to talk of this again. Sometimes this doctrine of election scares us. And you hear adverse things talked about it. My friends, it's not meant to be kept at an arm's distance or with a, away with a 10-foot pole. No, this is meant to be embraced. Even though you don't understand it all, it's meant to be embraced, to be held on to every day of our lives. We need the doctrine of election for our sanctification. We need it. This is of passion to me because I spent four years of my life writing, well, three years maybe, writing a doctoral dis- dissertation on that very subject how it is needed in our lives for every step of the way. The assurance of Romans 8 is not for unbelievers. We need to remember this. This assurance that you see in this passage, it's not for unbelievers. This is for God the Father's elected and adopted children. What is the assurance? (laughs) I, I love it. It's one sentence. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's almost like you could say, isn't it God who justified? (laughs) Remember, this justification is this declaration of righteousness. Who's going to bring an eternal charge of guilt against God's people? You can't. Why? Because it is God, the creator and sustainer of all life. He is the one that declared you righteous. This is the God of the universe shouting out unquestionable declaration, not only of full pardon, but a full restored relationship. I think of this in terms of this is not some lower level judge producing a soft notice of acquittal. No, 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 no. This is the God of all creation saying, forgiven. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How can you bring a condemnation of guilty when I, the God of all the universe, have declared him righteous? What wonderful assurance from the Apostle Paul. The key question number two, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Key question number three, let's run to this one. Who is then to condemn or who is to condemn? This is a bit stronger of language than the previous question. The previous question, uh, who, who is going to bring a charge? This one is, who is actually going to see this condemnation come to happen? It means to pronounce a sentence, to see it carried out. Who would dare even hint at condemning God's elected, adopted is probably the best word here, adopted children? Who is going to see this condemnation come about? What's the assurance that Paul gives us? My friends, he runs back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, though, he raised. More than that, he's at the right hand of God. More than that, he is interceding right now for us. Who's going to condemn you? No one. Why? Because not only has God declared you righteous, but Jesus Christ, the one who went to the cross, the one who raised from the dead, the one who ascended into heaven, the one who is interceding on our behalf right now, He is the one that is seeing this through. Again, the spotlight points straight to Jesus. Let's stop for a second and make this practical. Can we do that? I just said a lot of words. I hope you're tracking because this is so beautiful. Honestly, sometimes I think Sunday morning it's like we're drinking out of that fire hose. And I want to make this very, very practical when we go to the text of Scriptures. 
All right? Think about your week this week. Some of us are not far off of these questions. They're not unrelatable questions to what you and I might go through every week. Maybe even every day, maybe multiple times every day. What do I mean? You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You don't match up to this. You're an imposter heir. Any of these questions come to you? Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us find this assurance every single day. And here's the insurance. Christ Jesus is the one who died. Christ Jesus is the one who raised. Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God right now. Christ Jesus is interceding on your behalf right now. So when the accuser of the brethren comes your way and says, you're not good enough, you might be able to say, you're right, I'm not good enough. But he is. And he's interceding on my behalf right now. We continue on with another key assurance. This one really is the heart of all of what Paul is saying here in this text. In fact, someone would, would distinguish the first three questions from this last one. I think they all go together, but here's the key question number four. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Who will divide us from this love we have so enjoyed? In other words, once you have participated in this loving chasm-closing rescue, and I, I want us to think of this. When we come to Jesus Christ, that chasm is closed through Christ. Once you have experienced this chasm-closing rescue, who will dare, or even if they dare, who will be capable to reopen the chasm? No one. Why? God closed it through Jesus Christ. What's the assurance? Well, some bring these next series of questions into the key question, but I like to look at it this way. He asks this question, who? He answers it with a what. Did you see that? Why? I think he's just leading us to no-brainer conclusions, to be quite honest with you. They're like, this who? what is this who going to use? What weapon will this who ever use to create this chasm between you and, you and this God? And now we have a list of weapons. Here they are. Who shall separate us from the love of God, of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? all of these wielded weapons. It is as if Paul is saying, what weapon will you choose to create this chasm between a believer and his God? An adopted one and a gracious father. Choose your weapon. And the obvious nature, uh, obvious conclusion is what? Every one of the seven weapons. No, 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 no. No. And then we have this curious verse as the part of the assurance. Paul reaches back into Psalm 44, verse 22. And he says this, As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Why in the world did he include that in this section? You ever thought about that? You're reading through this section. In fact, I'll be honest. Sometimes when I'm reading this section at a, at a uh, funeral, I will intentionally leave that verse out. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to manipulate the scriptures, but it just, sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around that. But it's very important to the text. Why? Paul is saying, in other words, you know suffering in this life, guess what? It's anticipated. <laughs> It's even ordained by God that you go through this suffering. It's not abnormal. It's not new. The groaning that you're going through right now, every follower of God, every worshiper of God, follower of Jesus Christ from the beginning of time has experienced to some degree. Right now we could go to any number of texts that you know very well. I mean, we could even go right back to Romans 5 that assures us of this. We can go to James 1. 
We could go to Philippians 1 that clearly says you have been ordained not only to be a believer, but to go through suffering for his name. You can go to Hebrews 12, where God's people endured suffering for him. I mean, it's all through the scriptures, my friends. And and what's the conclusion we're coming to? When you're going through suffering right now, through these groanings that you can't explain, the temptation of our mind is to somehow think, God gave up on me. You ever think that? Or maybe you're tempted to think, God's plan is just not working. This glorification thing, I don't know if I'm going to get there. And what is glorification's assurance? It is this, who shall separate you from the love of Jesus Christ? Not one weapon can be used to separate you and create this chasm again that God wants closed through His grace. This brings us to the grand finale of the entire passage. If you want to memorize a couple of verses this week, memorize these. Romans chapter 8, this concluding assurance. I can just, in my mind, maybe someday I'll get an instant replay of this as Paul in this prison is writing these and he just tears coming down his, his eyes and he's just overwhelmed with joy. I can imagine maybe he's standing up like, get this, get this! What does he say? No. And all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. All of these things that can be wielded at you, all of these weapons to create a chasm between you and the God who saved you, no, in all of these things, we are beyond victorious. We are and will forever be victorious conquerors through Jesus Christ. The concept is you are more than conquerors. You are conquering conquerors. (laughs) if you want to be literal. You're conquering conquerors. You're victorious conquerors. You're complete victors. There's no loopholes. There's no loose ends. There's no incompletes. All right, even if you, I don't often do this, but if you take the the one Greek word that says uh, more than conquerors, it's made up of, of basically two words coming together. Beyond, and then this other word that you'll recognize because some of you have it on your shoes right now. Nikao. It's Nike. It's victorious. It is above victorious. Hooper Nikao. Beyond victorious through Jesus Christ. And now the grand finale list of assurances that we hold on with all we have. Paul says this in verse 38. For I am sure, I am absolutely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And if you could possibly think of anything else, we have this phrase, nor anything else in all of creation. I can't think of anything else. But if you could possibly think of one thing, you think, oh, there's a loophole there. Paul, I got you. No. So the final one, he's saying, nope, not one thing. In all of God's creation, and all things have been created by God. So there's not one thing that will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, praise God Almighty. To see the cherry on top of this section, we need to, in our minds, go back to Romans chapter 5, and just in our minds, how amazing is this, this section of verses? They're absolutely amazing because when you go to the first part of Romans 1, you see that there's nothing lovely in you. You're an enemy of this God deserving His full wrath, Romans chapter 1, 18. There's nothing in us that God looks down and says, yeah, i got to have that guy. Nothing. We're actually enemies of this God. But here's what Paul says through the Spirit in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, we were incapable on our own. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God 
shows his love for us in that while we were still what? Sinners. Christ died for us. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this week, let us live confidently for this Christ. Because not one person, not one thing will ever separate God from His people. God's people will always experience God's enduring love. So what? We want to ask what's going to put shoes on as we go out these doors. How is this going to make any kind of a difference in our lives this week? I'm going to tell you, man, God is use this text of scripture in my life this week. I got a head start though. <laughs> All week long I've been meditating on this passage, going to my knees, tears coming to my eyes, thinking, I don't deserve this love. I do not deserve this God. And his reassurance is, yeah, you're right, you don't. But that's what makes this love amazing. That's what makes this grace immeasurable. And I want to ask this question as we go our way. Are you finding daily assurance in God's enduring love? You. The brokenness of the world you live in. I'm going to tell you that the world we live in is good at creating imposter love. Fake loves. You will be accepted if, fill in the blank. If you do this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life will tell you, you will be accepted if you experience this expression of love from the world. My friends, if I could assure you of anything today, it is this, that will let you down. There's only one love that you can experience that will never let you down, that will endure to the end. It is the love of Christ Jesus. However, you cannot close without me saying this. For those who have not come to Christ in saving faith, maybe you've wrestled with this for some time, you have not come to Jesus in saving faith. You've not placed this repentant faith in Jesus Christ. Although you daily enjoy God's common grace, and you do, whether you know it or not, that's the first part of Romans, you enjoy His common grace every single day that you breathe and your heart beats. And you look at these beautiful mountains and you enjoy this rain at least um, two days out of the year. <laughs> that is all expressions of God's common grace. My friend, although you experience God's common grace every day, you cannot enjoy God's enduring love without Jesus Christ. You do not have this assurance of this passage. In fact, quite honestly, you have the opposite of this assurance in Romans chapter 1, 18. And I must say this, that you will experience the very wrath of Almighty God because of your sin. So this morning, my plea to you is this. Would you come to Jesus Christ today in saving faith? My friend, don't delay. Come to this Jesus who went to the cross for your sins. He is drawing you today. It is no mistake that you're here. Come to Jesus Christ. Those listening online, maybe you need to go to your knees right now and come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Those who might be listening on the radio, you might be driving right now, pull over. Come to Jesus Christ in this saving faith. For those of us who have come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, will you find your daily assurance in this overwhelming comfort? I appreciate what a commentary, his name is a commentator named Robert Mounts says. He says this, Christians are not grim stoics who manage to muddle, just muddle through somehow. <laughs> just make it through, oh boy. The Eeyore Christian. He says, no, they are victors who have found from experience that God is ever present in their trials and that the love of Christ will empower them to overcome all the obstacles in their life. My friend, that is you, that is, that is me. When we get up tomorrow morning, we can get up with confidence that there's no one who can condemn us, no one who can eternally oppose us. That chasm has been closed from, uh, from sin. Jesus Christ closed it. Let us live confidently with that fact. 
as they persevere in hope of future glorification, all true believers must find confidence in the personal assurance that God's plan is saturated in His enduring love towards them. I debated doing this, but I think I'm going to do it this morning. And that is close with a story that is near and dear to my heart. I was reminded this week of the story of a song that we just sang a little bit ago, The Love of God. Maybe that's near and dear to some of your hearts, but it is one of my favorite hymns of all time. Two of the three stanzas of this song were penned in the early 1900s by an exhausted California businessman. Kind of sounds like 21st century, too. (laughs) So this was the early 1900s by an exhausted California businessman named Frederick Lehman. As the account goes, Lehman was a man who loved God, but lost everything in a couple bad business deals. After being encouraged by God's enduring love in a Sunday sermon, I love that, Lehman meditated on the truth as he struggled to sleep all through the night. Through the next day, he penned the lyrics as they came to mind. He went from being a businessman to working with crates and stacking oranges, and he would write the words down on the crates as God would bring them to mind, as he would be reminded of the scriptures. And here's what he penned. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty paired, bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child, he reconciled and parted from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall or fail, when those who, uh, who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure. All measureless and strong, redeeming grace for Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. And here's the refrain, the chorus. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure. How measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. This is written by a businessman who lost all he had. However, this is only two of the three standards that we sang today. Lehman was convinced there needed to be a third stanza. He wasn't a songwriter. But all good hymns have third stanzas. Still kind of happens today like that. (laughs) So he prayed, he sought, he tried to find a third stanza in one of his books. This is so cool. He fell on an old card with a poem written on it. This is a poem that had been found written on the wall in a prison cell 200 years prior to Lehman writing this. This prison cell was actually for the crazy. An insane asylum prison. And in moments of sanity, one of the prisoners wrote down these words. Could we with ink the oceans fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill and every, every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. But my friends, that's not the end of the story. So not only was this the passion of Lehman's heart, not only was this the passion of this prisoner's heart who penned the words on the side of the wall, Now that we have modern technology, can search out certain poems, it came to find out that what this prisoner was writing was actually a poem that was penned by a Jewish worshiper in the 11th century. My friends, why do I share that? It's because this entire song is a testament to God's people clinging to God's enduring love for 2,000 years. 
just like we must today. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord.